Well, good morning. So you brave the rain. This is Noah's family right here, right? The rain doesn't scare us. We're here this morning. Well, thank you so much for coming, and Lord willing, uh, the rest of our people will be coming in here shortly. We want to begin with a time of prayer like we do every Sunday morning. Let me just read a couple of verses uh, to prepare our hearts for worship today. Paul says this in Romans chapter 12, verses 1 and 2. I appeal to you, therefore, brothers, by the mercies of God, to present your bodies as a living sacrifice, holy and acceptable to God, which is your spiritual worship. So today, as we begin the service, let me encourage you, just spend just a few moments, and in an attitude of surrender, in an attitude of sacrifice, Surrender yourself, your body to the Lord and ask him to do in you and through you what only he can do during this service. So let's spend a few moments in prayer and I'll come back and lead us corporately in just a few moments. Father, thank you for the privilege that we have to worship together. And Lord, as we just read in Romans chapter 12, Father, we present ourselves to you as a living sacrifice. So Lord, this morning we present to you our bodies, we present to you our wills, we present to you our our fears, we present to you our trials, our burdens, our blessings. Father, we lay them all at your feet today. And I pray that there would be nothing that we're carrying this morning that would hinder us from worshiping you. And I pray that there would be nothing in our mind and hearts that would hinder us from hearing from you today. So Lord, I pray that you do a work of grace in our hearts and lives. Lord, we pray for those that are delayed because of the rain and Lord, I pray that you bring them this morning, and Lord, glorify yourself in today's service. And we thank you because we know that you're at work in our lives, and we praise you for what you're already doing in our lives, and it's in Jesus' name we pray, amen. Let me ask you to stand this morning, it's uh, Jonas and Rachel who are leading us. The words, I've already listened to these songs today, the words are absolutely phenomenal. So allow the truth of these words to resonate in your mind and your heart, and let's worship together. Good morning, HCC. Thank you for thank you for being here in person and online. Are you here to worship our King Jesus? Are we here to worship our King who's redeemed us and set us free? Let's worship Him. This is the day that you have made. Whatever comes. I won't complain. Let's sing it because we believe. For all my hope is in your name. And now your joy awaits my praise. Let's lift it up. Say, I give thanks for all you have done. And I will sing of your mercy and your love. Your love is unfailing. Lord, I am grateful.
When I was down, you brought me out and set my feet on a higher ground. So here I stand, you are my God, the faithfulness, my solid rock. Let's sing it out together. Sing, I give thanks for all you. is a time for us to sing in one unified chorus, lifting our hearts to the Lord, proclaiming his goodness, laying our burdens at his feet. If you've come here to worship him, to give him everything, no matter how you sound, the Lord wants to hear your heart. So let's sing it loud together. And as we lift our hands, the heavens open, heavens open. So let our lives declare the love our God has spoken over us. And as we lift our hands, the heavens open. Lift your hearts today. So let our lives declare the love our God has spoken over us. So let, as we lift our hands, the heavens open, heavens open. So let our lives declare the
truth thank you guys i was thinking as they were singing you know i used to sing to my kids and my grandkids you can't hear me they can't hear me can you hear me now can you hear me now can you, I, I could do a commercial can you hear me now so anyways i was thinking as they were singing you know i used to sing to my kids and my grandkids and uh, they would normally tell me to stop and i was thinking as jonas and his wife sing to their babies they get a standing ovation probably, right? When they're done, it's like, yeah, another one. Incredible, incredible. I would love to be a fly on that wall when they're practicing at home. Anyways, it's great to be here with you today. I think I haven't been here since before I took the sabbatical. So uh, I just want to thank you for that. Thank you for allowing me to take some time off. It's one of those things you don't know you need it until you actually do it. So uh, it was great. Unfortunately, it ended with the death of my father. And uh, I also want to thank all of you for the great support you gave our family during that time. And uh, I don't think I had a chance yet to, to say thank you, but I thank you all for that. So today, today we're going to conclude a study that we began uh, a few months ago. I believe it was in June that we started the book of, of James. And you're going to have to forgive me. I'm going to ask you for forgiveness a lot today. But the first thing is this. You know, the book of James in Spanish is called Santiago. And that's my name. So I like calling it Santiago. So if I say Santiago in here, just know that I'm talking about James and not about myself. Okay, I did not write the book. But uh, it's also harder when Santiago is calling out a Santiago. You know what I'm saying? He, he called me out all week and... It was tough. It was tough. Anyways. So anyways, we're going to conclude this, the study of the book of James, of the letter of James. And, and he wrote this letter to those Jewish Christians that were scattered throughout the world. And we have to keep that in mind as we always read this book. Uh, James is a, an incredible um, practical book or, or letter and a very poignant letter. Um, he has continuously challenged us to evaluate our faith and to evaluate our spiritual lives. And I hope that he has done that for you as you have studied this book. He's one of my favorite books and the other one's First John because they both challenge me. You know, every time I read them, it's like I have to evaluate myself. Uh, where am I going here in my spiritual life? So he has made us question our works because he said our works are a reflection 
of the veracity of our faith. You know, he said, if works don't save you, but if you have faith that doesn't have good works, something might be wrong, right? So he has made us analyze that uh, both in our life and in the church community and outside of it. Uh, he's meant make us evaluate our language. How do we use our tongue? What do we do with our words, right? He said we sometimes curse with that tongue and then we're praising God on Sunday with that tongue. So what do we do with it? He has made, made us challenge us. He has challenged us in that. Aspect. He has also made us analyze if we use the wisdom of God to make our decision or if we're using the wisdom of our culture to make our decision. That's tough. That, that's a good question. That's a good place for us to analyze because sometimes we're so used to what the culture is doing and we kind of get numb at it that we bring the culture into the church and we feel it's okay. So it's great that he's challenging us to say, okay, what, what wisdom are you working under? What wisdom are you living under. Uh, last week, he uh, challenged us to live a life of patience. Not only patience for the sake of being patient, but patience with the motivation of the imminent return of Jesus Christ. So he was saying, I know you all are suffering, but that's going to end one day because Jesus Christ is coming back. And until then, let's be patient, right? So last week, we finished in verse 12. Uh, and that verse instructs us to live with integrity. With integrity. This is what the verse says. It says, But above all, my brothers, do not swear either by heaven or by earth or by any other oath, but let your yes be yes and your no be no, so that you may not fall under condemnation. Now, I don't swear much anymore, but I used to when I was a little kid. Oh, I, you know, we used to say, and, and every time we made an oath or, or swear by something, right, have you ever crossed your fingers? Oh, yeah, man. I, I, and we crossed the fingers on the back. What, what did that mean? Do you remember what that meant? I'm lying, right? I am not going to do what I'm promising to do, right? That's exactly what that meant. And that's what he's talking about here. These people were swearing by heaven and by earth, and it was really irrelevant. They were not going to do but they were making the oaths for. So that's why he's saying, don't, you don't need to do all that. You don't need to cross your fingers behind your back. Just let your yes be yes, let your no be you no, know, and basically live with integrity. That's what he's saying in this verse, okay. And it was a great ending to the passage that we studied last week, but I think it's a great start for the passage that we're going to study today. Because integrity is at the heart of kingdom life. And integrity must be at the heart of life in the community of believers. Integrity must be at the heart of what we do right here. If we don't have integrity with one another, we're not a spiritual community. We can call ourselves that, we can call ourselves believer, but integrity must be at the heart of what we do. True spiritual justification is demonstrated by both physical and spiritual integrity. So, James has spoken throughout this letter, not just talking about our faith, but also living our faith, right? He's saying if you talk the talk, that's fine, but now let's walk the talk. And if you're not walking what you're talking, you might be deceiving your faith, yourselves. Saving faith must result in good works. Saving faith must result in a righteous life. Good works do not save you. But they are the result of saving faith. First John says the same thing. In First John 1, 6, 7, he says, If we say we have fellowship with him, meaning if I say I'm a Christian, while we walk in darkness, we lie and do not practice the truth. But if we walk in the light, as he is in the light, then we have fellowship with one another, and the blood of Jesus, his son, cleanses us from all sin. So if we live in darkness, if we live in habitual sin, and this is, if you're not getting convicted by the Holy Spirit when you're doing something outside of the truth of God's word, there might be a problem. I'm not saying you're not safe. I'm not nobody to evaluate your heart. Only God can do that. But there might be. You know, I used to walk and talk in a certain way before I became a Christian. And after I became a Christian, I had to fight to stop talking like I used to talk. Anybody with me? I used to say words that were not very nice. 
colorful words. And my excuse was always, well, I'm in the car business, man. That's the way we talk, you know. But little by little, very little by little because I'm so stubborn, God changed that. I don't talk like I used to talk. Now, if 30 years later I was still talking the way I was talking before, I need to question something. Don't you think? So I think that before we continue our study to this letter, before we conclude, I would like to take a pause right here because we're going to talk about prayer today. And what I would like for you to do with me is kind of do a, a, an evaluation, an internal evaluation of where you're at. Always before I pray, I like to ask God to reveal to me anything that I need to confess before him. I don't know if you do it, but sometimes I sin and I don't even notice it. You know, I'm so used to doing certain things that sometimes I do something and, or think something or say something and I don't even notice it. So I like to go before God and say, God, can you bring to my mind anything I have done today that has offended your name? And then confess it, repent from it, and then go into prayer. So can we do that for a minute? Can you do that with me? Could you bow your heads? This is an internal thing. You don't have to say it out loud. Nobody needs to know. And, uh, and let's pray about that so we can walk clean before our Lord this morning. Father, this morning I ask you to bring to our minds anything that we may have done that has offended your name, Lord, whether of action or inaction, on word or even thought, anything that has not glorified your name, Father, would you bring it to our attention? Give us the opportunity to repent from it. Give us the opportunity to confess it before you, Lord. And Father, I ask, like you say in 1 John 1, 9, that you will cleanse us from all unrighteousness. That we may come clean before you as we bow our knees to listen to your word in your presence, Father. Thank you for allowing us into the Holy of Holies. And so, Father, we are going to open your word in an incredible difficult passage. Father, would you talk to our hearts and our minds and talk to each one of us according to your will. We thank you for your love. Thank you for your cleansing. And it's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. Thank you for doing that with me. Uh, so let's look at today's passage. Today's pass passage is a difficult passage, okay? Um, I am not the expert. So don't kill me, all right? Uh, I'm going to tell you what I believe God spoke to me about this week and what I've learned. But there is so much in here we can probably do two or three messages just on these verses. So if you will read it for me, with me, uh, James 5, verse 13. It says, is anyone among you suffering? Let him pray. If anyone cheerful, let him sing praise. Is anyone among you sick? Let him call for the elders of the church and let them pray over him, anointing him with oil in the name of the Lord. And the prayer of faith will save the one who is sick, and the Lord will raise him up. And if he has committed sins, he will be forgiven. Therefore confess your sins to one another and pray for one another that you may be healed. The effective prayer of a righteous person has great power. Elijah was a man with a nature like ours, and he prayed fervently that it might not rain, and for three years and six months it did not rain on earth. Then he prayed again, and heaven gave rain, and the earth bore its fruit. My brothers, if any one of you wanders from the truth, and someone brings him back, let him know that whoever brings back a sinner from his wanderings will save his soul from death 
and will cover a multitude of sins. A lot to unpack here. But my first point is to pray in all circumstances. I believe that's pretty simple to see there. Uh, obviously, they were in difficult circumstances, the people he's praying to and, or, or he's writing to. And the first thing he does is, is any one of you suffering? I could see the whole room going, yeah, all of us. Pray. The word suffering in this verse comes from the Greek word that means distress over various difficulties. So it's not suffering on one aspect, it's suffering in multiple things. And let's remember, he's, he's writing to people that are suffering persecution, some are suffering discrimination, some are suffering physical abuse, some are suffering verbal abuse, some are suffering from their owners or employers, they haven't paid their wages, and even others who are suffering from illnesses. So there's a lot of diverse circumstances here. Many and diverse were their sufferings. But you see the action that he's telling them to take is the same. Pray. Pray. Are you suffering today? Pray. And the prayer of the afflicted can provide a solution to the affliction if that is the will of God. If that is the will of God. Because... Prayer can also give us grace to endure the trial and not just cure the affliction. See, God never promises to remove all of our suffering and all of our sickness. There's no promise like that in the Bible. But God can turn our problems into triumphs because he gives us in chapter 4, verse 6, greater grace. Greater grace. Just as he did with Paul. You remember the story of Paul in 2 Corinthians 12? He had a pain on his side. He said, I went to the Lord three times. Now, I don't know about you. I see Paul like up here in his faith and I see me like down here in my faith. If I compare it to Paul, right? Do you think he prayed with faith? I think so. And what did God say? My grace is sufficient for you. I ain't taking the pain away, Paul. My grace is sufficient for you. And he, the, he then said, because my power is made perfect in weakness. You see? So it is the grace of God that also like it says in verse 13, it says that we're cheerful under the affliction. It is that grace of God that helps us to lift up our praise to the Lord even in the midst of of difficult circumstances. See, he says, are you suffering? Go ahead and pray, but are you cheerful? Who's cheerful? We're suffering. But if you're cheerful even under the suffering, you can lift your praise to the Lord. See, it's very easy to praise God, right, when everything is going well. I come in here, nobody can stop me from praising God when things are going well. It's like, ooh, hallelujah, gloria a Dios. Here we go. I do it in Spanish, come back in English. We praise and praise and praise. But when things are difficult, when they give you that diagnose, and you go home from the doctor's office, that radio is off. There's no praise and worship going on. That radio is off. See, that's a different thing. But God is calling us. Here by faith to lift our praise and give glory to God no matter what we're going through. No matter what we're going through. We have a great example in Paul and Silas. Paul and Silas in uh, Acts 16.25 says about midnight Paul and Silas were praying and singing hymns to God. Well, that's fantastic, right? It's midnight. They're singing praise. They're praying. Everything is great, right? Where were they? You know where they were when they, when they were singing this praise and praying? They were in jail. The next part of the verse says, and the prisoners were listening to them. They were in prison. So see, we must and we can sing wholeheartedly to the Lord if we live under the power of the Holy Spirit. That's what Ephesians 5, 18 and 19 says. Live under the power of the Holy Spirit. And then it says, and you can sing hymns and songs and spiritual songs. That's how you can talk to one. No matter 
what we're going to. So let, let's personalize these verses. Verse 13. Is anyone among you suffering? You don't have to raise your hand. Pray. Is anyone cheerful? Let him sing praises. Is anyone among you sick? Sick? Let him call for the elders of the church and let him pray over him, anointing him with the oil in the name of the Lord. And I, I want you to note the exhortations here. Pray, sing, and call. Are you sick? Are you suffering? Pray. Are you happy? Sing. Are you sick? Call the elders of the church. You know, sometimes people come to me, especially in the Spanish service, and, and Pastor, you didn't call me and I was sick all week. I'm like, oh, I'm so sorry, man. Uh, who, who did you inform in the church so I know who to yell at because they didn't tell me? Uh, no one. You didn't let anybody know, but you're upset at me because I didn't call you. It does say there, call. There's an action that we have to take. We're not there to sit around and just wait for things to happen. Pray, sing, and call. Now, the anointing of the oil that is mentioned here has two possible explanations or two possible interpretations. Um, I'll give it out to you. And I think both of them are, are faithful to the text, okay. Uh, first of all, the use of the oil in the Old Testament was symbolic of the presence and the anointing of the Holy Spirit. Okay. It wasn't just to put a little bit of oil. They used to take like a gallon of oil and just pour it over the people and completely drench them in oil. And that was symbolic of the Holy Spirit over them. Uh, you can see it when they're anointing a king or a prophet or a priest. It was used in religious ceremonies. Okay. So that's one interpretation. The other one is that oil was also used as a medical remedy. Okay. Where, where the sick person was giving like a massage with oil. I don't know if you love massages, but I love massages. And I do feel good when they give me one with oil. Okay. So you can see it in the, in the Good Samaritan that he was massaging the, the person that was ill with oil. So we can reason from that that James is suggesting that both prayer and medical remedies available to us are effective for divine healing. See, I pray over my condition, but I also drink my medication. And I believe that that medication came from somebody who's God, who God gave intelligence to to make this medication and who God gave the materials to to make this medication. So at the end of the day, it's God who heals, whether through the medicine or through the prayer miraculously. Amen? You agree with me in there? Okay, verse 15 says, and the prayer of faith. Now, if you, you know, underline your Bible, I, I would underline prayer of faith. What is a prayer of faith? It says, and the prayer of faith will save the one who is sick, and the Lord will raise him up. And if he has committed sins, he will be forgiven. Therefore, confess your sins to one another and pray for one another that you may be healed. The prayer of a righteous person has great power as it is working. So my second point here is that we need to pray with confidence and confession. We need to pray with confidence and confession. Now, these verses, as well as the last two that we're going to see in this passage, are a bit difficult to understand. And unfortunately, in our culture, many have used this, mess this passage to, like a magic formula... To convince believers that if you have enough faith, you will be healed. Or if you're not healed, it's because you don't have enough faith. Okay? And, and we hear that out there. Thankfully, we don't preach that in here because it's not true. However, this kind of thinking is contrary to Scripture. Nowhere in the Bible, nowhere does God promise to, to give us complete and total heal healing. And the example that we use of Paul is exactly that. We mentioned him earlier. Uh, this passage, though, is speaking of saving the sick one, and it says that the Lord will raise him up. Now, the word save there means to restore, to rescue, or to preserve. To restore, to rescue, or to preserve. And I hope you can follow me on this. So 
on the one hand, this can speak of physical restoration, but on the other hand, it could very well speak about spiritual restoration. To save or preserve from eternal destruction. Okay? So, then the, the word to rise up can refer to physical manifestation of healing, meaning that the person rises up after he's healed. Or it could talk about the resurrection in the last day where the person will be risen. So we see an example of this, and I know this is a little confusing, but just follow me with me here. We see a little example of this when Jesus was healing the paralytic in Mark chapter 2. You remember the story? They're in a house. They make a hole in the roof. They bring this paralytic person down. And what is the first thing that Jesus tells this man? Anybody remember? Son, your sins are forgiven. That's it. Oh, wait a second. I can't walk. I'm in a floor mat here. What's going on? My sins are forgiven? Your sins are forgiven. See, the spiritual restoration certainly hints that this man will be risen up at the end of the days with all the saints, right? He was already restored spiritually. Your sins are forgiven. And the Lord will raise him up at the end of the day. Now, for the people who gather there to understand about spiritual healing, because they said, well, who are you? Only God can forgive sin. Right? That's what the Pharisees told him. Who are you? Only God can. Oh, really? Well, let me show you that I am God. And then he says to the man, my friend, rise, pick up your bed and go home. In other words, Jesus restored him and raised him physically to demonstrate the restoration that had already happened spiritually. You see that? Because for God, your spiritual health is a lot more important than your physical health. And if he has to keep you sick in order to, for you to grow spiritually, he will keep you sick. See, many of us are praying for healing and healing and healing and healing. And we only think about the physical. And I know it hurts. It hurts when you're going through stuff physically. But just think about it. What is God doing to me spiritually that he is allowing me to go through this? What is it that I need to learn? That's normally my prayer. God, what do I need to learn so this can end? <laughs> so you can take me out of this. So Jesus goes on to say that is the prayer of faith. Or, pardon, forgive me, not Jesus, James. The prayer of the faith that will... To restore and raise the sick. So what does he mean by the prayer of faith? Man, I, I ponder about this. I read a lot about it. And I think I'm in agreement, and this is Jose's opinion, but I think I'm in agreement with Worsby, who says that the answer to the prayer of faith is found in 1 John 5, 14 and 15. And 1 John 5, 14 says this. This is the confidence that we have before him, that if we ask Anything according to his will, he hears us. And if we know that he hears us in whatever we ask, obviously we ask something according to his will, we know that we have the petition that we have made of him. See, to me, the prayer of faith then is a prayer made knowing what the will of God is. Now, it is obvious that in many times, in many occasions, we don't know what the will of God is, right? I mean, I remember in 2009, I lost my job with the car business, and I wanted to get right back into the car business. I mean, five days before losing my job, everybody was offering me jobs. After I lost it, nobody wanted me. I don't know why. You would love to have all this in your shop. But I was praying for a job in the car business. And by October that year, God had me working in church. I was praying for the wrong thing and didn't know it. I was not praying according to God's will. That's why it's so important that at the end of the prayer we say, God, may your will be done and not my will be done. 
Okay, because sometimes, most of the time, I would say to myself, I don't know how to pray. Thank God for Romans 8. It says when you don't know how to pray, guess what? Shut up and the Holy Spirit will take over. That's my interpretation, Santiago's version. <laughs> but if you don't know what to pray, we can confidently say that God, not our will, but yours be done. And we can pray with confidence. So we see also that that person that he's talking about is a person that is in sin, has strayed from the path. And we should not only pray for each other, he says we need to confess to one another. When I, I, I thank God that I got a few men in my life like Pastor Brian, like Mike, like Rome, the elders. Men that I can sit with and I can confess my sin. And I know that they will pray for me. I know they're not going to go around saying, you are not going to believe what Jose just told me. Oh, my friend. I know they're not going to do that. You need to have that in your life. If you don't have someone that you can sit with and be completely transparent with, please get somebody. Now make sure that this person is more mature than you spiritually. Because you can ruin somebody less mature by confessing things. And then when, when I confess to Brian my shortfalls... He can pray more specifically for me. You see what I'm saying? So I think that we can pray with confidence knowing that the will of God will be. But we have to confess to one another so we can pray specifically for one another. This is, this is powerful, my brothers and sisters. As a church, we are called to live a life of transparency. And most of us don't. Most of us don't. We hide behind the good looks, the nice makeup. We smile as we walk in and everything is always fine. Of course, that doesn't mean that next Sunday everybody's going to stand up front and confess all your sins to everybody. You, we're not going to do that. No, no dirty laundry here. Because that could actually harm weaker brothers. But we must have someone... To confess with. And there's both physical healing and spiritual healing when we confess our sins. In 1 John 1, 9, God says he will heal us from all righteousness. But we also can confess to those that we affect by our sin. And Matthew 18 says you gain a brother. You gain a brother. All right, so at the end of verse 16, we see that an effective prayer is done by a righteous person. Who is a righteous person? It's a person that has been justified by faith in Jesus Christ. Okay? We're not righteous by our works. We're righteous by the blood of Christ. So James has already made the point that life of sin obstructs prayer. So you've got to be righteous. You've got to be cleansed or clean before God. And that's why I did the exercise we did before. We have to come clean before God in order to pray to God to have a prayer of a righteous man and that prayer be effective. Effective is, means that it's active, that it's operative. And, and, and finally he says that that prayer, this kind of prayer that is effective, that is fervent, accomplishes a lot. It's fervently praying before God. The illustration he gives is of the prophet Elijah. You can see his story in 1 Kings 17 and 18. We're not going to go there. But Elijah, Elijah, James defines it as a man of a nature like ours. He was just like us. He was just like us. Now he was a righteous man and he prayed fervently according to God's will. And that's the key. A righteous man praying fervently according to to God's will. So he prayed fervently and it stopped raining for three and a half years. And then he prayed again fervently and God opened the skies and sent the rain. So this is the idea. Just like Elijah, 
you and I can pray in all circumstances with fervor and with the confidence that God's will will be done. That's the key. And honestly, this should be common in a Christian community. We should be praying for one another continuously, fervently. If we're not doing that, we're failing at our call. All right, let's look at these last two verses. And like I said before, they're very complicated. I had a long struggle with these verses. Even last night, I, I was keeping Brian from his beauty sleep by asking questions and going back and forth. And, and so... We don't have time to look at this with a magnifying glass, but let's see what we can get from it. Verse 19, my brothers, if anyone among you wanders from the truth and someone brings him back, let him know that the whoever brings back a sinner from his wandering will save his soul from death and will cover a multitude of sin. So the point I put is pray for those wandering. Pray for those wandering. Let's first notice that James is speaking directly to believers, okay. He says, my brothers. And, and he wasn't talking about one church. He's talking about all the Christians around the world. We are brothers and sisters in Christ with all the Christians around the world. I love that. Okay. So he says, my brother. Second, the person who has gone astray is a brother. It's a believer. He says it's coming from among you. So there's a brother that has deviated some from the truth of the word of God, right? The third person he mentions, the third, this person that has been strayed from the truth, that is from the word of God, uh, can, you, you can deviate from the word of God in two ways, okay? One is doctrinally. Maybe you start listening to somebody that got a false doctrine and you're starting to pay attention and you're starting to deviate. And the second one way is by conduct. I start uh, acting in a way that is not good or according to the word of God. Fourthly, he says, whoever brings him back. And this whoever, this person is also a member of the body of Christ. Whoever from the members brings him back. And basically is this. God, is using, God uses people like you and me to help. Other brothers return to the truth of the word. This is important, guys and ladies. God uses people just like you and me to help others that are wandering from the word. Think about that for a moment. Because in every congregation we have these two types of people. We have people who little by little are straying from the truth. And we have people that are supposed to be helping them stay in the truth. Now, obviously, I don't know your heart. You don't know mine. I can't tell you if you're a Christian or not. I don't know if you're wondering or not. That comes with the confession part that we were talking about. Uh, or maybe being caught in sin, like it says in Galatians 6.1. But, but we're here to help one another. And Galatians 6 says, and be careful. That's why I'm telling you, find somebody that's more mature than you are because he says, be careful that you don't fall with the other person into the sin. And we're supposed to help each other, not to sit down and criticize him, not to gossip about them, but to help them and love to get back to the truth. That's why the Christian life cannot be lived in isolation. You can't, you can't be a Christian alone at home. I need you and you need me. We need each other. And then listen to this incredible statement on in that last verse. Whoever brings back a sinner from his wandering will save his soul from death and will cover a multitude of sins. He calls sinners the Christian that has deviated from the truth of the gospel. But why is it important that we are returning this, play, this person to the truth? And why is it important that he repents from his sin? It says here, because we will save his soul and cover a multitude of sins. Now those are the words that are difficult to understand. And many have used that to say that we can lose our salvation. But for some reason, God has ordained that souls be saved through the use 
of human agents, believers like us. God is the author of salvation, but he uses human beings as agents of salvation. I mean, we sow the seed, but he waters it and makes it grow, right? It's the book of Acts, and, and I'm translating in my mind, so forgive me, I get it wrong. But he says, you, your faith increases by hearing the word of God. Now, how are they going to be saved if they can't hear it? How are they going to hear it if nobody preaches it? And how are they going to preach if no one sends them? Right? We normally use that for missions. But that's here for us. If my brother's deviating from the truth, how, how is his faith going to increase if I don't give him the word of truth? We're here to plant the seed. So I want to let somebody smarter than me explain this. And that is John Piper. Anybody know John Piper? I like John Piper. He's way up there. I got to listen to him 15 times to understand what he's saying. But it's okay. I'm just a little slow. But, but John Piper wrote what he calls the five theses on eternal security, the perseverance of the saints. And I just want to point him out there, be patient with me, because I think at one point you're going to say, what? Just, just wait until the end and then beat me up if you want to. Okay? So the first one is this. We are justified by grace alone, through faith alone, apart from works. Right? I don't know if you know of the five solas, but it's sola gratia, sola fide. means we're justified by grace alone. Through faith alone. I think we all agree with that. Ephesians 2, 8 and 9 says, For by grace you have been saved through faith. This is not of your own doing. It is a gift of God, not a result of works, so that no one may boast. And Romans 3, 28 says, For we hold that one is justified by faith apart from works of the law. We're good, right? Everybody agrees? All right. Second one. Those who are justified will certainly be glorified. I think we agree with that one too, right? Those that are justified by faith alone through grace or by grace alone through faith will be glorified. This is a guarantee. Jesus says, no one will be lost from my hand, right? Romans 8.30 says, and those whom he predestined he also called... Those whom he called, he also justified. And those whom he justified, he also glorified. It's all in past tense. It's a done deal. It's guaranteed. We agree? Okay, let's go to the third one. <laughs> but no one will be glorified, meaning finally saved, who does not continue in the faith. Do you agree with that one? No one, he just said that it was done deal. But then he says, but no one will be glorified who does not continue in the faith. Look at what 1 Corinthians 15, 1, 2 says. Now, I will remind you, brothers, of the gospel I preached to you, which you receive, in which you stand, and by which you are being saved. We're in the process of sanctification. We are being saved if... if if you hold fast to the word I preached to you, unless you believed in vain. Colossians 1.21 says, And you, once were alienated and hostile in mind doing evil deeds, he has now reconciled in his body of flesh by his death in order to protect, present you holy and blameless and a rough reproach before him. Verse 23, If indeed you continue in the faith, Stable and steadfast, not shifting from the hope of the gospel that you heard, which have been proclaimed in all creation under heaven, and of which I, Paul, became a minister. And one last verse, Matthew 10, 22. And you will be hated for, by all for my name's sake, but the one who endures to the end will be saved. Now you're saying, okay, Jose, you just told me I'm justified by faith, by grace, through faith. You said it was guaranteed that I was going to be glorified. But now you're telling me if I don't persevere till the end, I'm going to lose my salvation? Is that what we're saying? That's not what we're saying, but that's what you're thinking, right? That, that's, that's what it sounded like. And trust me, I, it says that. 
But this is the key. How then can you and I persevere until the end? That's the question, right? So because I sin almost every day. No, I sin every day. <laughs> that almost was not true. It's a sin. I lied. <laughs> Oops. I got to go ask for forgiveness now. Again. Um, but I sin every day. And I'm willing to bet that you do too. So how are we going to persevere to the end? Listen to number, am I number three or number four? Number four, I think. God himself, listen to this. God himself will keep his children from finally falling away. Woo. Relief. God himself will keep his children from finally falling away. Philippians 1, 6 says, and I am sure of this. I am confident of this, that he who began a good work in you will bring it to completion. It's not something I'm going to do. God is going to do it. 1 Corinthians 1.8 says, he, meaning God, will sustain you to the end, guiltless in the day of our Lord Jesus Christ. God is faithful by whom you are were called into fellowship with his son, Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen is right. God himself will help the believers persevere until the end. Isn't that great news? Amen. Now, so the question is, how is God going to do this? Right? That's the question. So if he's the one that is going to help me persevere, how is he going to do it? Here it is, number five. God keeps his children by means of his children. That's what we're reading here in this verse. God keeps his children by means of his children. Hebrews 3, 13 says, but exhort one another every day as long as it is called today that none of you may be hardened by the deceitfulness of sin. For we have come to share in Christ if indeed we hold our original confidence firm to the end. You help me, I help you. That's why he can say in here, where is it? Let him know that whoever brings back a sinner from his wandering will save his soul from death and will cover a multitude of sins. Because it's God doing it through us. You see, all this is complicated, at least for me, but this is what I know. It is God who saves the person. It is God who helps us persevere. And he uses brothers and sisters in Christ to help each of us from falling in sin and to persevere. Amen. So my church, let's pray fervently. Let's pray persistently for our church, for each one of us in general. So that the will of God may be done in our lives and in our church. Amen. So then what, what can we say to end this letter? Let me just say this and I'm done. Let us live submitted and surrendered to the Holy Spirit of God so that his wisdom, his fruit, his truth, and his love reign in each one of us. And like David said the other days, that it may overflow towards all the brothers in Christ and those that are surrounding us in our community. That's our call. And I believe that's what the letter of James is telling us. Let's pray together. Oh, Lord, it's sometimes so difficult to understand things. It's even harder sometimes to apply them. 
But thanks be to God that you have given us brothers and sisters that can help us finish the race well. And Father, I pray if there's anybody here that doesn't know you as their Lord and Savior, Father, may today be the day of their salvation. But then also if there's any brother or sister that is trying to walk this walk alone, I pray that today they will find somebody, someone that will come and walk with them hand in hand. So they might pray for each other. So they might confess to one another. So that we may be healed spiritually and perhaps physically. Pray this in the name of Jesus. Amen. Amen. Thank you, Pastor Jose. Everyone, I invite you to stand if you are able. Um, and if you haven't grabbed the elements for communion, they are in the back. Um, so we're going to worship right now. We're going to sing together, take communion, and then worship through song once more. Welcome, saint and sinner, there's room enough for all. We're no longer cursed, no longer lost. We are now his children by election and by blood. It joins us here together at the cross. Every pilgrim, every prodigal, every wayward son will find all that's worth finding as they gaze upon the one who took on flesh, became the lamb and bridged the gap of God and man and joins us here together at the cross. Standing in the chasm of a vast eternity, a beam of hope from heaven down to dust. His love has spanned the distance far as west from east and joins us here together at the cross every pilgrim every prodigal every wayward son will find all that's worth finding as they gaze upon the one who took on flesh became the lamb bridged the gap of God and man Joins us here together at the cross. Life and death have intersected from the depths we resurrected.
took on flesh, became the lamb and bridged the gap of God and man and joins us here together at the cross. And joins us here together at the cross. And joins us here together at the cross. Amen. Amen. Thank the Lord for the cross. Amen. Thank you, Jose, for the message. I always appreciate every time Jose speaks. He's got such a humble heart. He really does. Even last night, he told me, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to just throw him under the bus a little bit in a good way. He said, Brian, and if I say anything wrong, you have the freedom to come up and correct me when I'm done. I love that. I couldn't have said it any better, Jose. Yeah, <laughs> that's right. Yeah, would you meet with me in the office as soon as we're done? We'll do that. I appreciate his heart. Today, we want to end by taking the Lord's Supper. I would say this, if I could just add one thing to what he said. Is we cannot do life in the Christian life alone. We desperately need one another. We do. And I want to challenge you with what he said. If you don't have someone in your life to whom you can make yourself accountable. Would you speak with any one of us, with myself, with Jose, with any one of our elders? Man, we would love to help you because as iron sharpens iron, so we help each other. And that's the way we grow in our Christian life. If you're, if you're sitting back on your own, say, man, I just want to do this on my own. That's not the way we were intended to do it. And so we'd love to be able to help you. Today, we take the Lord's Supper and we talked about this idea of confession. and I know we did it at the moment, but Paul tells us in 1 Corinthians 11, he said, before you partake of these elements, examine yourself. So in the quietness of the moment, would you once again examine yourself? If there's any unconfessed sin, now's the time to confess it. Take just a moment and prepare your heart to partake of these elements. Father, we are so grateful today for the forgiveness when we confess the forgiveness that is available to us through Jesus Christ. And Lord, it's not just confession for the sake of confession. It's not just getting something off of our chest. But it's agreeing with you that what we do, what we've done, what we've said, what we've thought displeases you. We thank you that because of Jesus, because of the shed blood of Jesus, because of the broken body, because of his vicarious death, taking our place on the cross, paying the price for our sins, forgiveness, justification, and glorification is possible because of Jesus. We thank you for that. Today, as we take these two elements, we take them out of a heart of gratitude, and we take them out of a heart of worship, realizing that everything we are, everything we ever hope to be, our future, everything is bound up in Jesus. He who began the good work will finish it. We believe that by faith. So, Lord, as we take these elements, I pray that it would be a demonstration of our faith, of our love, of our commitment. And we take them not just individually, but we take them as a family together, confessing our faith in Jesus together. And Lord, as we do that, I pray you do a work of grace in our lives. And in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Jesus said, this is my body which is broken for you. As often as you eat it, you do it in remembrance of me. Then he said, this cup is the New Testament. It's the new covenant of my blood. As often as you drink it, you drink it in remembrance of me.
then he said there's coming a day when we will no longer take it here upon the earth but we will take it in glory with him and one day he will lead us together let's sing just a little bit more and let's worship and I'll come back and conclude in prayer in just a second John I'd like to sing just a snippet of a song it won't be on the screens but you guys know it he became sin, who knew no sin, that we might become his righteousness. He humbled himself and he carried the cross of so Jesus Messiah, name above all names, blessed Redeemer, Emmanuel, the rescue for sin. Oh, love. 
Amen. A couple of announcements. Let me encourage you to be faithful in your giving. You can give a variety of ways. We have the boxes in the back. You can give online. You can give in a lot of ways. I'd encourage you to do that. I also want to announce, I think I saw Lori Dowling is here. Scott, Lori's down there. Lori, we're so, so, so Lori works at Hope Women's Center, and I know they're having their banquet. Lori, I can't remember the date of that. What is that, September something? 22nd, and uh, we'd love some of our people to be there. She has a table. If you're interested in that, speak to Lori at the conclusion of the service. And then uh, we also have a luncheon today for all of our Ukrainian families. And so for all of you, you're invited in room 100, whether we spoke to you or not. If you're one of our Ukrainian families, we'd love to have you join us for lunch. Let me pray over you. Father, as we leave today, help us to realize who we are in Jesus. Help us to realize what we have in Jesus. And though we're not perfect and we fail, thank you for the, the truth that you are working in our lives and you are bringing us to completion that will ultimately one day result in our ultimate glorification in your sight. Thank you for that. Holy Spirit of God, do a work in our hearts. Make us sensitive to yourself. Help us to realize that we need one another. And as we worship together, as we pray together, as we encourage one another, Lord, I pray that you'd strengthen our faith, help us to be more like Jesus. And as we leave here, help us to realize that we are the living representatives of Jesus Christ in our community. Help us to live this week like kingdom citizens. And it's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. God bless you. Have a great week. Lord bless you. face shine upon you, be gracious to you, Lord turn